Yes, okay, so I guess it's recording. Okay, so first of all, uh, good evening everybody or good avond. Uh, I don't speak Dutch yet, sorry about that. But yeah, so my name is Luis Rocha then, and today I want to talk a little bit about complex systems, uh, particularly about econophysics and social physics. Uh, so before I start, I want to thank uh, Julian for his uh, kind invitation to give this talk, also to Fleur uh, for her uh, hosting uh, this, this session. Uh, I'm actually very glad and very happy to talk about this. Uh, and I hope you can get some feeling uh, about uh, complex systems, about econophysics and social physics. These are very broad research areas quite developed nowadays. Uh, so of course I cannot cover everything, but uh, I hope that you can get a taste of it. Uh, I also think it's a bit unfortunate. We cannot meet face to face, but uh, yeah, uh, it's COVID again. Uh, but on the other hand, if you get bored with my talk, you can just go to Instagram or Facebook uh, I hope you don't do that, but I'm just saying you can do that since we are online. So that's uh, the, the, the good side of the coin, right? Okay, uh, oops, uh, let's see, okay, yeah. Uh, I just want to briefly mention something about me. Uh, as uh, it was said, I'm professor in econophysics and social physics. So uh, at Ghent University, I'm associated to the Department of Economics and the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And I also lead the Complex Systems Institute, which is a interdisciplinary research group uh, where we use uh, network and data sciences uh, to study social and economic problems. My background is in theoretical physics uh, more specifically in computational physics. But in the last 10, 15 years, uh, I've been working in different departments, uh, in different research areas, uh, in different countries, uh, but I mostly worked with social networks and epidemiology. So I both use methods, existing methods to, to try to understand new data, to make sense of new data, but I also work uh, developing uh, new methods, especially network methods and network models uh, to try to also uh, understand uh, social and economic systems. So uh, I'm very interdisciplinary person, uh, let's put in this way. But that's enough about me. So what I planned for today is to talk a little bit about social physics and econophysics, so to, to give a, a brief definition of, of uh, what this is all about. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about complex systems because these are very much related. Uh, and finally, I, I will give some examples so you can get some concrete idea of what is social physics and what is econophysics. Uh, and finally, uh, remember to take a screenshot uh, or print screen. Uh, I will give some pointers. So if you like this topic, you can search for further information, right? And learn more about that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't yeah. think the slides are uh, coming through. They're not changing. I still see the title slides. Is oh, that really? I'm, I'm in the third slide. Okay. Uh, I don't know. What can I do? Oops, let's see. Uh, okay, now I see the third slide. Yeah. Maybe I will not make a full screen then. It seems to be a problem somehow. Uh, these computer technologies, right? Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. It's, uh, let me adapt here. Uh, okay, so uh, oh. <laughs> that's a bit confusing. Okay, this was the previous slide. <laughs> where I, I talked a lot about me, uh, but that's not important. So uh, this is, okay, that's the outline for the day uh, I, that I just mentioned. 
but okay, I will not repeat, but uh, you got the, the idea, the plan of the, of the talk. Okay, so the first thing is, so what is physics, right? I'm sure you all know about this, but let's try to review it a little bit. I like very much this definition of physics that says physics is a natural science based on experiments, measurements, and mathematical analysis with the purpose of finding quantitative physical laws for everything from the nano world of the microcosmos to the planets, solar systems, and galaxies that occupy the macrocosmos. So it's a very nice definition. And I highlighted here physical laws. And that's why I like this definition, because here it says uh, that physics is about uh, uh, physical laws of how the nature uh, functions, right? It's not restricted to laws of physics, which is a little bit different, but it really deals with physical laws, trying to understand the behavior of things. So physics, uh, according to this definition, is a very broad science, right? It's all about understanding nature. It's basically the mother science, right? If, if you can think in that way. But, uh, okay, uh, yeah. So social physics is then uh, a sub area of the physics, right? And social physics is essentially about using this toolbox of physics, right? The tools, the concepts, the models uh, to understand or to study how uh, society behaves. So it's basically to understand uh, the behavior of humans and animals. This is social physics, right? And it's very interesting that the term social physics, uh, it's quite old. It comes from the 19th century and it was uh, coined by Adolf Catelet, uh, who was a PhD here at Kent University, very nice. Uh, so he wrote a book about the mathematical modeling of society. And then he called it this new discipline social physics. So his book was very much about statistics, actually, uh, where he talked about the concept of an average man and how this average man can help to understand society. So he was very much thinking about the Gaussian distribution and things like that. Uh, but there is a fun fact here uh, that uh, there was this guy, August Comte, uh, who originally coined the term social physics uh, to, to his own discipline, to what he was uh, studying at the time and some other people. Uh, so basically they were trying to understand social phenomena as well. But he rejected this idea of mathematical modeling to understand society. And then he got pissed uh, with, uh, with Catelet, but also because uh, Comte was French, so we always have these situations. Uh, but he got very uh, pissed and then he decided, okay, this, what you do, it's not like what we do. So let's create another discipline and let's call this sociology. So that was what happened. And sociology, as we know today, is uh, much more, uh, it's, it's much less about mathematics than social physics, right? And the roots of these differences dates back to 200 years at least. Uh, but social physics is, uh, is an evolving discipline. I mean, it has been always around, uh, but it gained a lot of popularity in the last 40 years, and especially in the last 20 years, you know, with all these advances, advances with computers, uh, plenty of computer resources, plenty of data coming up. Uh, and then it became much more easy to, to talk about social uh, problems from a more mathematical, more data perspective. And it's very interesting because econophysics essentially has the same story. So econophysics, the definition is, it's also uh, the application of this toolbox of physics or these principles of physics to study financial markets, 
but also other types of economic systems. So it's not only about finance, uh, but it's a lot about the, econ uh, the economic uh, systems, uh, broadly speaking. And the first guy who, the first physicist who, who actually worked with economics was Daniel Bernoulli. So he proposed a solution for some gambling problem at the time uh, using the concept of utility. And utility, I'm not going to details on that, but utility is a very central concept in economics. Uh, it refers to this value that we associate to goods, to services when we buy them. So it's not about the financial value, you know, the 100 euros that you pay, but it's about the satisfaction and the usefulness that you associate to something. So it's a very uh, important concept. And it came out from a physicist. The fun fact here that I have is that Daniel Bernoulli, you know, is the same guy from fluid, uh, fluid dynamics that we studied uh, in physics. Uh, he's known as a Swiss uh, physicist, but he was born in Groningen uh, in the Netherlands. And what is more interesting is that his family originally came from Antwerp. So they were from Antwerp and then they went to Switzerland, then to Groningen and then to Switzerland again. So it seems like uh, the origin of social physics and econophysics all collapse in Belgium. So it's a very nice thing. Uh, econophysics is also an evolving discipline. I mean, it has been around. The word econo econophysics uh, popped up in the 90s uh, when uh, it also became much more popular. So it was more or less the same as social physics. The difference is that uh, the physicists were working a lot in the financial market, uh, trying to understand the stock market, uh, sorry, uh, already in the 90s. So it, it actually started a bit before uh, social physics. I mean, this new revival, let's say. Uh, but also it became popular, very much popular in the last 20 years. Okay, but what, uh, what the, do these things mean in practice? So uh, essentially, as physicists, what we try to do is basically to come up with simple models to explain this complex phenomena in social and economic systems. So what we do is we try to borrow uh, these ideas from physics, like, you know, concepts as springs, energy, particles, spins. We do a lot of uh, models using random walks. Uh, and we basically get inspired by these, use sometimes the same mathematical tools uh, and try to look uh, to phase transitions, to scaling laws, to percolation thresholds. You know, all these things we study a lot in statistical physics. We try to adapt that. Uh, to the social and economic systems. But one thing that really distinguishes, I think, uh, physicists than other people uh, working, so trying to understand society, trying to understand economics, is that we try uh, to find uni universal patterns. So we, we really try to find the same patterns across different systems, across different uh, disciplines. So we try to find the fundamental mechanisms that generates uh, certain patterns that uh, drives the evolution of certain systems. And we try to describe these uh, using the same tools, the same mathematics, you know, the same models. It's really about uh, bringing all together uh, into a, a, a single uh, theory. Of course, we are far from that, to be honest. Uh, but that's the mentality of physicists, right? To simplify and to find uh, patterns of universal behavior. And at this point, I just want to mention something about modeling. I'm sure you also know everything about model, uh, but I want to emphasize that because modeling is very central 
I mean, to understand, really understand the concept of modeling, uh, it's fundamental if you want to understand complex systems, if you want to understand social and economic, uh, social physics and econophysics. So I put this uh, sequence of drawings by Picasso, and you can see he's trying to do a model of a bull, right? So he started on the top left with this uh, very realistic draw drawing of a bull, and then he goes like on cutting the noise and removing irrelevant information or excessive information until he reaches this very simple drawing of a bull. So you see just with a few lines, uh, he can actually capture the essence of a bull and describe the bulls uh, in a way that we can identify that as bull, right? So social scientists and economists, they are more like in this region, right? They try to take the, the model of uh, the systems they are interested on and go a bit deeper and try to make you know, a very careful description, trying to go very deeply to understand how they function. But the physicist, it, it's not to even here, right? We are a physicist and that's the kind of bulls that we like to draw, right? We, we like to assume there is a spherical bull or cow with uniform density that uh, has no gravity in a vacuum. And that's what we use to uh, describe uh, social systems and economical systems. That's not very much appreciated sometimes uh, outside physics, but we can get uh, many interesting insights just by simplifying these, all these uh, complicated uh, systems to very simple things. Okay, at this point, I want to briefly say something about complex systems. Uh, first of all, it's very difficult to, to define what is a complex system. I mean, we don't really have a, a agreement on a definition, so it's a, a bit blurred, uh, but this one is kind of okay. Uh, it's kind of an attempt to, to define complex system. So it's essentially a complex system is essentially uh, large populations of units, for example, people, animals, banks, organizations, airports that self-organize somehow, generating patterns, normally macroscopic patterns, storing information and engaging in collective decision-making. So uh, although it's, I mean, it's a bit debatable uh, how to define it. It's maybe easier to identify a complex system if we look to some general properties that complex systems normally exhibit. One thing is <clears throat> normally they are composed of many elements. They have uh, that interact in a nonlinear fashion. Sometimes they interact in a linear fashion and generate nonlinear outputs, which is fantastic. Uh, most of the time <clears throat> in complex systems, you have a network topology. I, we will see a little bit more about this later. So the parts of the system are connected somehow. Uh, you have this positive and feed, negative feedback, right? For example, if you think about the stock market, when you have like a bull ear, which means that people want to buy. And the fact that someone wants to buy just increases the price of the stocks. And then more people want to buy because they believe that the price will increase later. And this positive feedback just make the stock price uh, increase until it uh, <laughs> collapses some most of the time. Well, not most of the time, but uh, many times, right? Uh, but some other interesting uh, features or properties of complex systems uh, are that they are normally adaptive and they evolve. So depending what happens in the evolution of the system, it can adapt, it can change uh, its behavior, uh, which is very nice. Uh, it's also robust uh, against perturbations. 
So that means, for example, if, uh, if in the airport network, you know, if you think about the flights around the globe, uh, even if some airports randomly fail, the functioning of the flight network or of the flights at the global scale will continue to, to function properly. Right? And, and normally this is because uh, complex systems have different levels of organization. So normally you have these hierarchies uh, that uh, put the system or the parts of the system together. And then also two other uh, important concepts that were in the, in the definition that I just mentioned is the self-organization and the emergent uh, behavior, emergent phenomena. So this is uh, about the local interactions uh, that the agents of the system have. So they interact independently, like at the local level, and this creates uh, some global behavior. Right. So, for example, you see COVID, right? Uh, COVID or any infectious disease, it, it spreads through contact between two people, right? But if you look at the macroscopic scale, you have this pandemic that we have been facing for a year, right? That's a typical uh, emergent uh, pattern in complex systems. Okay. So what I want to propose you just quickly, just to, to exercise this a little bit. Uh, first, make a print screen of this, uh, this slide or, or, or um, just copy it quickly. I will add you in breakout rooms just for two minutes. Uh, don't worry, just very quickly. And try to discuss a little bit with your colleagues in the breakout room. Uh, about some systems that you think are complex systems. Uh, I mean, just try to come up with one case of a complex system and try to identify some of these properties in the system that you thought about. Even if you don't understand this fully, uh, it's okay. I mean, it doesn't need to follow all the properties, right? Just think about a few of the properties Maybe it's a big system that interact in some nonlinear way. Anyways, just do this quick exercise. Uh, let me see here. Okay. So just two minutes, right? Okay, I think we have some more seconds and then everybody will be back. 
one. Yes. Okay, I guess everybody's back. So, uh, oops, let me move here. Oh, that's complicated. Okay, so you probably realize it. I will not ask examples, but you probably realize that there are so many complex systems in society, in nature, right? Uh, you can think, for example, about uh, COVID, as I said, Ebola. If you think about the economic systems, I mean, look to Brexit, right? What a mess these English guys did. Now I cannot buy my ciders in Belgium anymore. And that's because of Brexit. So that's a typical uh, complex system. Uh, but you think about the climate as well, ecology, right? Uh, we had this uh, forest fire close to Antwerp uh, maybe a week or two ago and just started by a simple uh, thing and then it spread quite quickly. You have all these biological systems like the brain, right? You have the, the, uh, the strikes, you have congestion uh, on, on, the, on the highway. So complex systems are very much uh, are very much common uh, in, in, in nature, right? So, but the interesting thing here, and I want you to keep thinking about that later, is how to identify these properties. I mean, to give a bit more formal definition of complex systems to what we think they are, right? So, uh, one important thing also that I want to, to emphasize about complex systems is um, that it has, uh, uh, I mean, it has this idea of holism, right? I mean, in science, especially in the last uh, century, we have been talking very much about reductionism, which is trying to take a, a, a complex system, split in different parts, and understand these parts separately, and then connect everything to explain the whole. But the complex systems, we do something different. We try to see the interaction between the parts. So we don't isolate the parts, but we study them uh, together. Uh, there is even this uh, very nice saying that you maybe have heard before, that the whole is other than the sum of its parts. Many people tell the whole is more than the sum of its parts, but that's not, that was not the original quote. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you need to put uh, the parts of the system together if you really want to understand how it will evolve. And then uh, a central thing when you think about connection between the parts of the system is uh, network science. You have this fantastic uh, place in Brussels that I needed to show. So um, networks uh, are essentially graphs, uh, mathematical graphs. So if you think about uh, a graph, so it's, it's just a set of uh, nodes that are connected according to some rule. So the nodes can be people, can be animals, can be the banks, can be the airports, uh, can be computers, so it's very broad. And the connections between them can represent different things. It can represent interactions, it can represent uh, relations, social ties, or interdependencies between these parts. So, but what is very important here is that when you model a complex system as a network, the information of the system is in the structure of connections. So the structure of connections in this uh, framework in this network framework is uh, it tells you very much about the system. So it's very important to understand that, right? Okay, uh, I give this uh, brief uh, overview and now I want to give a few examples like some more concrete examples. So to make sense of all this uh, theory that's put in this way. So the first thing I want to talk to you, uh, to you uh, about is uh, uh, it's a model about residential segregation. 
So there was this guy, uh, Thomas Schelling. Uh, he, he wanted to understand uh, the segregation between white and black people in the US. Uh, so in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, he come up with this simple model um, where he tried to reproduce these basic mechanisms. So he, he, he wanted to understand how simple individual incentives and the individual perception of our surroundings could lead to segregation uh, in society. So his model was uh, very simple. So he basically assumed there were any individuals uh, in this population and they could be of two types, A and B. For example, uh, Dutch speaking people and French speaking people. Right. So he distributed these N individuals in a chessboard or in a lattice or a regular network, if you prefer, and left a couple of places empty. So that was his initial configuration. Then he decided to introduce some interaction rule. So it's actually quite simple. What he assumed is that it takes one guy and looks to the surrounding, looks to the neighbors of this guy. If the fraction of neighbors is below a threshold, the, uh, this guy just move to an empty place. So basically this threshold is a kind of tolerance level. So if the threshold is low, it means the tolerance um, is very low as well. So I, I cannot support living uh, nearby uh, people different than me. So I just move to another place. But if the threshold is high, that means I tolerate living uh, close to people that are different than me. So I don't move out, okay? So that's a very basic uh, uh, interaction rule. And what is very interesting here is that if uh, there is some sort of uh, critical threshold, so there's a segregation threshold. So if this threshold X that I mentioned, this tolerance level uh, is low, that means uh, initial random population will continue uh, randomly distributed over time, right? Because uh, I'm okay, I mean, I don't need to, uh, to be, uh, close to people like me. I'm fine to live uh, with people that are different than me. Uh, but if the threshold increases, at some point, clusters start to emerge in the system, right? And there is this critical threshold of 33% or 130, where small clusters start to appear in the system, you know, because people start to move and tend to live uh, close to others similar to them. So if the threshold X is much above the segregation threshold, you see the emergency of, uh, in this case, uh, two or three clusters of people uh, of the same type, right? So you see, just there is just a simple rule. You just look around and depending on this threshold, uh, the population continues mixed or it will be clustered uh, in similar people or of, uh, with people of similar type, right? This uh, you can describe also using uh, some tools from, from the um, uh, writing the Hamiltonian and explaining this as the spins and so on, uh, but I'm not going into that. The second model I want to mention is about inequality. So uh, there was this guy, uh, Herbert Simon. In the 50s, uh, he tried, to, to, uh, uh, he tried to, to describe mathematically this process that is known as cumulative advantage or this idea that the rich gets richer or, or better, the rich get richer. Uh, phenomena or process. Uh, we, we see this uh, in different situations. I mean, it's not only about uh, a wealth person uh, 
having more chances or being more likely to get wealthier. But we also see that um, cities that are more populated, they have a higher probability of attracting more people and increasing at a disproportional rate in comparison to smaller cities, right? Uh, it's the same uh, if you have more friends, you're more likely to attract more friends, right? You develop more skills or maybe you're more sociable. Uh, and then of course you will have a higher chance of, uh, of having more friends. The same about infectious disease, right? I mean, if there are lots of infections or people infected in some region, there are higher chances uh, of uh, getting infection. But the important here is that these relations are not linear, right? It's not just that you double the chance of being infected, for example, but you have a disproportional chance of uh, getting more infected. Um, and there are two ingredients uh, in this model. One is growth uh, and another is preference. So just by using these two ingredients, uh, Simon developed his model. So the model actually, um, uh, uh, the original intention of the model was to describe the frequency of occurrence of words in the text of books. So that was uh, his original intention. Uh, but the process, as I said, you can do analogies with other systems and the process can describe different phenomena. But anyways, in his case, in the Simon Moldo, uh, he designed this discrete time stochastic process, right? And the idea was to, to basically try to reproduce how a book is written. So assume that you have um, any written words in a book, F, K, T, gives the distribution of words at time t. So the probability that you will find a word that appeared exactly k times. So you start with a few words and then the, the, uh, the model evolves like that, like the, the evolution of the model is like that. At each time step, you add a new word in the book. So with some probability alpha that is constant, you add a completely new word to your book. But with a probability, uh, but the, the probability, sorry, that the word uh, has a red appeared in the, in, the, in the book is proportional to the frequency of occurrences of this word in the past, right? So with fixed probability, the word is completely new. Otherwise, uh, the word, uh, the, the new word will have a probability proportional to the times that it was, uh, that appeared in the past in the book, right? So only with these two ingredients, uh, you can write a master equation and then you can describe how these probabilities evolve over time the chances of uh, getting a word and so on. I'm not going to this, but what is important here is that if you solve this master equation, you will get the stationary uh, probability of finding a word k times. And what is very interesting here is that this probability, it's uh, proportional to one over k to the power of some constant beta plus one. So we have a power law uh, distribution. We don't have a Gaussian, we don't have a Poissonian, we don't have these well-behaved distributions that we normally see uh, in social systems on, or that people normally model uh, in society. So we have this distribution. And what is very interesting here is that it says that the probability of finding a word that only appear a few times is very high, right? So if K is small, this probability is very high, but there is a probability is small, but uh, non negligible that uh, a few words will appear many, many, many times uh, 
but they will appear. So, and that's what happens here. If we look to the distribution here, to this PK, uh, you see here is the, oh yeah, it's P, uh, PX. Sorry about that, but PX here means PK, and here is K, right? So this is the distribution of words in the book. And then you see here, like the blue circles are real data, empirical data. I don't remember the name of the book, but um, it's, uh, it's the same across different books. So you see the probability here of uh, a word appearing just a few times is very high, but the probability that uh, maybe one, two or three words will appear many, many times uh, is quite low. But you see, it follows a power law. So there is no characteristic scale in this distribution. And what is interesting is that you see this kind of distributions, as I mentioned before, in different systems. So this is the distribution of wealth in the US. So you see you have a few very rich guys, but we are maybe more on the left side. And if you take the number of calls, uh, mobile calls, for example, it also follows these power law distributions. So it's quite broad. Okay, so the last example I want to give, it's about my own research. And I think it's very appropriate to talk about sexual networks. After all, it's uh, third, Thursday evening, right? Um, so the thing with sexual networks, um, well, sexual networks, essentially, you know, uh, you have nodes, which are people, and if they had a sexual contact, uh, you have a link between these people, right? And then if you collect this data for everybody uh, in, in a city, for example, you can form a sexual network. But the first thing you probably realize is, wow, this is quite difficult to get. I mean, who are going to say uh, who are their sexual partners, right? And that was the nice thing I did. Uh, I didn't ask people actually. But I found this, oops, I found this website where people go uh, and write about their sexual encounters with sex workers. So essentially you have clients of sex workers, they go out, they have, a, let's say a date, and then they write a report about this, they review the encounter, right? And this, uh, this is a website where you can do that. And uh, it's quite spicy sometimes. So this is in Portuguese, I will not translate. Uh, but what is important here is that for each sex worker in the website, you create a thread. So different users, different clients can write about them, right? So what is important for us is that in a review, you have a user. So you have the ID of the user you know who is the sex worker, and you also have the time that uh, this review was written. So you kind of know when they had sex or potentially had sex. From this information, you can, buy, uh, you can build a sexual network, right? You just connect the users with the, the escorts or, or the sex workers, and then you create a nice network. So here I put some statistics because when you have a network, remember the first time you need is to understand how it looks like, what is the structure of the network. Once you know that, you can do some other modeling and understand how things uh, behave on the network. So just uh, uh, briefly, uh, what is interesting here, this is quite a large network, it's around 17,000 people. And most people are in what we call giant components. So in theory, if you have a, a, a diffusion, for example, between any two nodes, uh, or sorry, if a diffusion starts in one node, it can basically reach uh, any other node in the network. So that's a very important characteristic of uh, networks. Uh, another thing is that uh, have uh, around 41,000 uh, links or edge or contacts in this network. Uh, but you see, 
uh, if you think, if you look at the number of encounters, it's 10,000 more. So that means some people, they write more than once about the same sex worker. So you have some very active people in this website. It probably costs a lot of money, but uh, well, who cares, right? But what is interesting here as well, um, I will talk about two measures, basically. One is the average distance between any two nodes in this network. So the distance is basically the number of hopes that you do to reach from this guy, for example, to this guy. So the distance here is two. If you calculate the distance in the whole network is around six. And this is higher than you, what you would expect by chance if the network was completely random. If you measure the number of four cycles, and four cycle is like this square, it's actually, it's also much higher than you would expect by chance. So these two things together means that the contacts in these networks are very uh, clustered together. And that is because people who live in the same city, they of course tend to go out, tend to buy sex with people at the same city. So this is reflected in the sexual networks. But another thing that is very interesting here is that if you make, uh, if you calculate the fraction of edge uh, between cities and the distance between these cities, it falls like one over distance to the power of two. And that is something we call gravitational law for obvious reasons, right? Uh, and this kind of pattern is very common in different social and economic systems. So if you think about the number of calls between people or the, num or the amount of trade between countries or between cities, it also decays with one over distance square. And that's the same in this case. Okay, uh, another thing I want to show is this, um, uh, the distribution of contacts per node. So if you take one person in this network and see how many sexual contacts this person had, then you can build an histogram or a distribution function like this, right? And what do I see here? Uh, you see here is the, is the degree, is the number of contacts per person. And this is the probability that a, uh, uh, to have a, pe a person uh, with a certain degree. So if you look at this, it's not really a power law as we have seen before, but it's still quite broad, quite heterogeneous, right? So you have a very act some, some very active people on the right. So these people do a lot of sex, or at least they buy a lot of sex or at least they just write a lot on the website, right? We cannot say that for sure, but most people, they're not very active and they have just a few contacts, but still you have this very broad uh, distribution here, right? And another interesting thing about this data is if you take the time between two contacts, you know, uh, I've wrote, I write a review today and then I wait some time and write another review, either about the same sex worker or about a different one. If you take this inter-event time or waiting time as we call and make a distribution, it also follows this broad distribution. So this is what we call burstness behavior because uh, the activity is very burst. So you have lots of uh, uh, very high uh, or very short time between writing uh, different posts, but sometimes people wait uh, maybe years to write again on the website. These bursts are everywhere in complex systems, not only on this data set. But okay, now it's the last thing I want to talk before we finish. Now that I know everything about the sexual network, I can study how infections spread on this network, right? So to do that, there are many models about infectious disease, but I will just take the simplest one, which is called susceptible infected. So in this case, 
uh, people are either infected or susceptible. So if a susceptible makes a contact with the infected, it will be infected uh, with a certain probability and just remains infected forever. That's our assumption. Very simple, very straightforward. And then what you see is if you look to the prevalence of infections here on the y-axis over time, you see that the, uh, in this red curve, that's the, no, the fraction of people that gets infected over time. You see, it has nothing to do with this uh, exponential growth of COVID that you have seen uh, in, in, on the news. Uh, in this network, it's flatter. It's a more linear growth, right? But what is interesting here for us physicists is that if you take, you know, remember the, this network has times of activations. So it's, uh, and, and I've shown that we have this burstiness. So if you randomize these times and you mess up with the temporal sequence of, uh, of contacts, and then you simulate again the infection, you will see that the infection will grow slowly or is lower than it would in the real network. And that makes us conclude that this burstness that we have seen in the real life, it speeds up, it accelerates the spread of the infection, right? Because people do uh, very quickly uh, contacts. So this basically makes the infection spreads faster. But then on the other hand, what I do here is I simulate again uh, in the empirical network, in the original network, but then uh, instead of messing up with the temporal sequence, I mess up with the structure of the network. So I basically just randomize the connections, make this network random and simulate again the infection. And then you see the infection now grows faster than it would be in the empirical network. That's because those clusters that I talked before, right? When you have a clustered network, an infection will tend to spread first within this cluster and then move to a different cluster. So the clusters kind of uh, reduce the speed, reduce the spread of the infection, right? For this reason, it's good to close the borders sometimes, and not always, but this is a topic for another discussion. Okay, I would like to talk more about the social cows. Yes, cows are social and I can prove it or I, give, I can give evidence for that, but we don't have time. So I will just conclude. You see, I like cows. So just to conclude then, um, I hope you got some feeling about what is social physics, what is econophysics. It's a very broad uh, or they are very broad disciplines uh, that are uh, quite, uh, I mean, quite lots of results, very interesting methods, and fundamentally based on physics concepts and tools. But what is very important here is that what we try as physicists is to, to try to find, you know, the fundamental laws. We just want the most fundamental mechanisms that make uh, society work that make the economics work. Uh, we don't want to go into too many details. And that's, uh, that, let's leave this for the economists and sociologists. Because in the end of the day, what we want is really to find some simple universal laws to describe nature, as we have been doing in physics for many centuries. Uh, we want to do it now uh, with economics and with social systems, right? Okay, if you like that, I want to advertise that I have a course, a uh, master level course in the Department of Economics about networks in social economic systems. Uh, I would say half of the class normally comes from physics. So it's a very well balanced. I'm sure you will enjoy if you apply to that. But in the physics, we also have this course given by a colleague of mine, Professor Jan Fick Bush, on complexity and criticality. So that's a, also a course in the Master in Physics. Uh, I also strongly recommend. 
Uh, and then there are this couple of books. I suggest you make a print screen if you like. These are all like soft readings, book that you can read um, during the summer if you like. You can learn a lot about uh, this concept. And if you like something a little bit more technical, I recommend these two books. So Network Science by a very famous uh, professor working network science. It's free, you can get it online. And if you want to know more about econophysics, uh, you may have a look in this book. It's a little bit outdated, I might say, I may say, because uh, you know, there are lots of developments in the last 10 years, 15 years, especially involving networks uh, that it's not so much reflected in this book. Still, it's an excellent book. And if you just want to watch something else, I recommend this documentary, The Power of Six Degrees. It's also about networks. Uh, or this talk uh, or seminar by Professor Mark Newman, who is an excellent speaker, much better than me. And he will also talk about physics of complex systems. Okay. And finally, uh, you can always contact me if you want to talk more. I guess we will have space for some questions as well. But you can also uh, have a look in the web, in my web page, and also the web page of our team, uh, and also you know find some papers there. Try to uh, to uh, to get more information, more technical information, or even do a master with us, PhD with us also. Okay. Thanks a lot, and that's what I had to say today. Okay.